1570 WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Welcome to the Caregiver Reality Show with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiato, who bring you more than a combined 25 years of practical experience, helping thousands of family caregivers, helping them find solutions to the challenges and frustrations presented by this important responsibility. So if you are in the position of caring for a spouse or a parent, a loved one who is no longer able to care for themselves, or if you know someone who is, this hour will be worth the listening. Now, let's tune in to today's edition of Caregiver Reality with your hosts, David Levy and Paul Vadiano. Good evening, South Florida, America, and the world. This is the Caregiver Reality Hour, and I am your host, David Levy. I want you to know that you can see us on caregiverreality.com. You can also see us on WNN 1470. Dot com. You can hear us on iHeartRadio. You can see us on AMP2 TV. And so you have got no reason not to see or hear us. And I'm here with, as always, with my co-host, Paul. Very good evening to you, David. You are listening. You're wearing a very dapper tie. Most of our radio audience can't see it, but it's a beauty. Has a volume control on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get into how was our caregiving week, which we normally lead off with, um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, this weekend, Paul and I were at the uh, Regents Park Health Fair, and it was really done extremely well. Uh, a shout out to everybody there who made it such a success. And um, I want to say thank you to Leslie Curtis, who was directing it, and she did a marvelous job for her first health fair at Regents. Um, the other thing I want to mention is there is a phenomenally bright lady by the name of Lynn Friss Freeberg, and she's been around for quite a while, and she writes a lot of the opinion column for AARP. And so she wrote a column, this or a blog rather, this week that was picked up by uh, a number of people. And it had to do with the word informal family caregiving. And she really took offense to it. And I understand why. And I just want to quote a couple of things because it made good sense to me. Knowing how complicated caregiving is, even when it's kind of casual, she made the point as by the word informal family caregiving as if this were merely some sort of a casual relationship. You know, something like pals getting together every couple of weeks for tennis. Informal caregiving isn't even the worst of these descriptions. That award goes to free caregiving. The implication that there's no cost to support that child, that th what that child gives to her parent or a wife provides for her frail husband. And as a result of that, um, we've kind of eliminated informal, and we just refer to it as unpaid family caregivers. The 50 to 60 million caregivers that are out there every day, and I think it's a big disservice to call them informal. They're working hard. They're many times holding down not only their caregiving job, but their job at work. They may be also taking care of kids, and they have their own responsibilities to themselves as caregivers to try and maintain a lifestyle around and through caregiving. And so kudos to, uh, to Lynn for bringing this up, and I think I've eliminated the word informal from caregiving going forward from here. And um, so uh, all of you out there, you've now just become unpaid family caregivers. <laughs> And so, Paul? I think her point is really well taken. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough job, and the people that are out there should be acknowledged for all that they do. And it is not informal when you have that responsibility on your shoulders. Right. And, um, you know, earlier today, I was dealing with a caregiver who came in whose hair was on fire, as usual. Um, husband had dementia. And bright lady... Uh, in a community that sees a lot of caregiving and didn't have the biggest idea where step one was. And uh, she had been referred to me by another caregiver. And by the time we got through, 
she really had not so much that she was that much smarter but respectfully she knew that she had met a competent authority that understood what she was going through gave her the time to express what was concerning her most and then refocused it on what needed to be done first what needed to be done second she didn't know where she should be in it and um, and she was a little late coming to the to the fair so to speak but we got her turned around by the way I also at the same time I pointed her at our dinner partner Thursday night Scott right. Solkoff because he's so good he's just an excellent elder law attorney um, to go through all the necessary paperwork, see if asset protection would help her and possibly qualifying for Medicaid at some point down the road. And, um, you know, when you get somebody like that and you can really kind of make a difference quickly, uh, there's a lot of reward in it. And I know, Paul, what you and I do makes a difference in so many people's lives. I know that sounds self-serving, but, you know, we speak with passion. We know what we're talking about and we're here to try and help you. Yes, and part of what she left with, I'm sure, was a sense of confidence that she was going to be able to survive and to do this job, and there were people there who really cared and understood the predicament that she was in. Absolutely. So how was your week? I know it was difficult. You can get into it as much or as little as you care to. You know the old saying, there's good news and there's bad news. Right. Well, uh, I'm, I am going to start with the really good news, and that is Sunday was our, ni our ninth wedding anniversary. And Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And Debbie held it together so that we could go out and celebrate. We had a marvelous brunch, and honestly, David, it was like old times. The, you know, the Isn't it great when it can be that? It really is. Even if you only get it for a little while. Yeah, and, and the word never creeped into the conversation throughout the whole time that we were there. Uh, but it never goes away. No. And there was a, a bounce back, and the last... A couple of days, it's been rough, and uh, she, while she had rallied for the dinner, the disease came back, and you know a lot of the aches and pains are really there. Mm -hmm. And I know later when we talk about our cookbook, uh, you know some of the, the the feelings that are associated in in our recipe book right. certainly were were present in my mind. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Right. How about Suzette? How's she doing? Well, she's doing better. Um, I'm pleased with her progress, and uh, this week we're going to find a new primary care physician because um, the one we had kind of slipped at the switch, and I'll just leave it at that. I've been able to get her back on the medications that she needs for her condition and bring her up slowly, and I'm seeing an improvement, uh, and this is the first improvement that I have seen and I can't tell you how long. And while we went through a horrible mess when she came off of all of her meds, getting back on just the right ones and doing it incrementally, I, I can't tell you what a difference it has made. That pharmacy soup can really be a problem. Oh, it is. And, um, you know, you, people forget. You get caught up in, I need to have all of these meds, but do you really? You know, and she was on many. All right, more than ten, bigger than a bread box. All right, <laughs> now we're on five, and two of them are melatonin, which is to just help you sleep. It's over the right. counter, and the other, an aspirin. So the other three are pretty, you know, it, it's just what she needs for her serotonin, and uh, one other because she has high cholesterol. How about her knee? Her knee is doing great, even though it it hurts at night. Um, she's really made remarkable progress. She gets around much better than she gives herself credit for. And we're actually, I think, over Memorial Day weekend, going to see if she can get behind the wheel of the car so that she can out, be out there again being a dangerous shopper. <laughs> <laughs> credit card in hand. She cannot wait 
to get back into all of the issues, yeah. all the things that she's been denied for a while. So, but I'll be very pleased to see that. So and you're feeling good about things. I'm, I'm, really, care I'm really feeling very good. I think the doctor that did the knee surgery, mm -hmm. anybody that's contemplating a total knee replacement and says, oh my God, it's, it's not a, literally a walk in the park, but considering how difficult it was for somebody like Suzette, it really went very, very well. We found a great guy to do the knee surgery. He did it right, and it came out right. And so I'm very pleased. Well, awesome. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, here we are. It's the Caregiver Reality Hour. I like that so much better than show. You can call us on 1-88-565-1470. You can see us on WWNN1470.com, caregiverreality.com. And if you go to Caregiver Reality, we also have archived there right now about the last 12 shows and three support groups. And so you can really get a good handle on how we approach caregiving if this is the first time or the second time you might have been listening to us because we have moved in the last few weeks uh, to drive time right. and so anybody that wants to get a better handle and one of the things I want to mention is that uh, Brenda who is our head of education and does all kinds of things you know to help put all of this stuff together has started and has been working with some individuals in the LGBT community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, and to set up support groups and to do it in a way that really is meaningful. And the folks that she was training are from the LGBT community. But we wanted to do it right. And so in order to prepare properly, we wanted to raise some dollars to do it correctly. And we, we decided we would do something that's very much in vogue these days. It's called crowdfunding, where on the internet, if you are a worthy cause and you have a not-for-profit, and here we're using the American Association for Caregiver Education, the mm -hmm. not-for-profit that I started in caregiving back in 98, and it's on CrowdRise. All right, www.crowdrise.com forward slash LGBT Family Care Action Program. I know that's a lot, but if you go to www.crowdrise.com, LGBT, you probably don't need all of the rest of it in front of the slash. And it's going to be a very worthwhile project where we're going to be following a lot of the metrics so that if this is a successful program, as many of our others are, we will be able then to replicate it for others around the country and know that not only is the support group program, but the educational backup for it is valid meets the community need, meets the individual's need, and so I'm, I'm very, very proud of her and what Caregiver Reality and American Association for Caregiver Education, and you as well, are trying to do in that direction. She has done really just an extraordinary job, and she is so true to mission of what the organization is about, and actually getting it down to that very personal level for various communities, various groups, that it would have meaning for. Because as we might think it's appropriate, each individual group is going to interpret they need a little bit differently. Right. And her skill sets are so deep that when she was editing the book, when she was putting mm -hmm. together educational programs, syllabuses, and outlines, I mean, she just is amazing. And I say to her, why don't you come on the show and let's, and she said, no, 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 don't want to, you go do it. So anyway, this is a big shout out for Brenda, and thank you, and folks, if you can get to www.crowdrise.com, LGBT, and if you got a few extra dollars that you can put towards it, um, we're really looking to make a difference with this. Back to you, Paul. Well, David, we started a couple weeks back on talking about our cookbook, our caregiver's cookbook, and where we start to substitute out some of the ingredients from a traditional recipe to create what we call our caregiver's upside-down cake. Right. 
and uh, and we've been swapping out ingredients. Yes, we have. Uh, yeah. And two weeks ago, we we substituted for butter frustration, mm -hmm. and last week, guilt for flour. Mm -hmm. And so, what do we got this week, Paul? Well, we have to have milk in order to make our cake, our caregiver upside down cake, and right. we're going to substitute out resentment. Ah, a great emotion. A really hard emotion. It eats you up. It does. Mm -hmm. And it either turns inward or it turns outward. And its its soulmate is guilt. Oh, well, they live in the same house. Oh, they sure do. Right. Um, go ahead. Well, sometimes that resentment, even though we don't want to admit it, lurking it's it's towards what we have been asked to do and you know intellectually we know that it's the disease that we really resent but there are times that we have those moments that we say oh why is this something that is in my life I wish it weren't there and sometimes we just find ourselves in a place where we know we don't want to be and it, we know we need to step back at that point right well resentment is also so difficult because many times we resent a doctor a hospital social security medicare things and people you know people that used to be our best friends and now because your husband or your wife has dementia they've kind of backed away like they're going to catch it or something but somebody once gave me a great line for resentment because it's focused at others who don't even know how you're grinding up inside and so it's right. like taking poison and hoping the other person dies <laughs> all right not going to happen very readily but that's really a pretty good definition of resentment because you're the only one that's suffering with it rarely do they know that you resent them and even if they do if it's part of that big system out there medical legal financial whatever well, they I, don't they don't even care no they don't and i over poured on that ingredient just recently with with debbie when uh, going to physical therapy mm -hmm. and she wasn't feeling well and they insisted upon pushing her to do a full hour. They kept pressuring her that she needs to come three times a week and explaining to them beyond her capacity at this point. And they just kept arguing. And finally, as her advocate, I, just stepped, said, in. I stepped in and I said, no. But I tell you, David, I really resented the fact that they lost the humanity of who she were, was and, and had no appreciation for what she was going through. And she They just bewildered. wanted to make it a billable moment for the PT that they were offering. I'm taking anything away and from physical therapy. And they're very good at therapy. what they do. Exactly. But they didn't realize in Debbie's condition that she couldn't go through the whole thing and I'm sure I know because my daughter's a physical therapist that when many times you'll get a reluctant patient that needs to be pushed and pushed and pushed Debbie wants to do it she does and she'll she's like the energizer bunny in that respect she'll try and try but then what happens the same thing with Suzette she'll wake up one morning and decide today's the day to clean the house and steam clean the roof you know, and she'll go out and try and do all those things. And for the next two days, we suffer because, she, you know, and so she had a good day Sunday when you went out for your anniversary and then compounded with the PT. No wonder she's flat on her back well, today. Well, we're driving back from the physical therapy, and she turns to me and she said, she says, are you resenting having to take me to physical therapy? And I, and I said to her, I said, no, sweetheart, I don't resent you at all. What I'm resentful about is the fact that these people, despite their well intentions and all their skills, they just weren't listening. Mm -hmm. They did not have an empathetic ear towards the way that you were feeling. And I, I felt that resentment sliding into anger. And, you know, we... I had to deflect and get away from that and move into something else and started started talking about what was coming up for the weekend. Okay, very good. Yeah, it's Memorial Weekend. How fast this year has been flying. Um, a, you're listening to us on WWNN 1470 AM. 
You're listening to us on WWNN1470.com, caregiverreality.com. Give us a jingle at 1-888-565-1470. Or we're also on Amp2 TV. And not only that, but we don't know all the places we're, we're on because Freddie, our producer, has managed to get us out <laughs> everywhere. And so people say, I saw you on YouTube. I saw you on iTunes. I saw you whatever. And it never ceases to amaze me in this technological day and age where I am a dinosaur, just how far and wide um, we're getting our message out. And each week, in terms of listenership, and I'm not e only the stuff we can track, we have the first week we were on, we've been on now three, four weeks. The first week we were on, we were X. The next week, we were half again as much. The following last week, we had doubled where we started from, and there was a 50% increase going into this week. So um, we really have had a wonderful, wonderful um, opportunity and a great response. And that's thanks to our audience who are in their cars listening, visiting, and being part of our show. And uh, David, I actually picked the show up on the crystal radio that I made when I was five year old with the toilet paper roll and right. winding the wire around it. I love it. Anyway, Paul, we're going to have to take a break. I know okay. we have a caller on the line. Caller, please stay there. And we'll be back right after the break. Are you a family caregiver? Are you taking care of a spouse or loved one who can no longer take care of himself or herself? Are you dealing with Alzheimer's disease and don't know what to do? Do you feel burned out, frustrated, and just don't know where to turn? You've tried doctors, lawyers, and mental health professionals and have come to realize that they don't have practical answers to these questions. What you need are experts, non-clinical family caregivers, with 25 years of active experience helping thousands of family caregivers like yourself. People who can help you provide a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one. Who you need are David Levy or Paul Fadiato. Reach David at david at caregiverreality.com or reach Paul at paul at caregiverreality.com and let them help you pick the right path towards improving the quality of life for you, the caregiver, and your loved one. My name is Paul and I am a spousal caregiver. I am one of 50 million caregivers just here in the United States alone. I keep my wife safe. I help maintain her dignity. I help give her the best quality of life possible. And above all, I am her advocate. Yes, there are times that I get angry. I become frustrated with the system. Sometimes I feel resentment and I deal with guilt. And I know that I am not alone. When I need support, I turn to caregiver reality for help. My name is Paul Vadiato, and I am president of Caregiver Reality. Find us at www.caregiverreality.com. Help is a click away. CFC support helps fund research. You can too. Each year, thousands of men and women serving their country in the U.S. military, as well as other employees of the federal government and the U.S. Postal Service, provide support for medical research to find treatments and cures for diseases. This is done through the Combined Federal Campaign, an annual workplace giving campaign that allows eligible individuals to support charities, such as those that conduct medical research, through a payroll deduction. Money donated this way to the medical research charities and its member organizations helps fund research to fight diseases from Alzheimer's to cancer, multiple sclerosis, blindness, breathing disorders, and much more. The diseases included afflict people of all ages, from the very young to the very old. You don't need to be a member of the military or a federal government employee to support research to help you or those you love that are suffering from an illness or disease. Donations to our not-for-profit tax-exempt organizations are tax-deductible and provide a vital source of funding in the fight to defeat some of life's most dreaded diseases. Please visit the website of the Medical Research Charities, which can be found at medicalresearchcharities.org. That's all one word, medicalresearchcharities.org. On that website, you can learn more about our 
member charities and make a donation in support of the research they're conducting for a specific disease or family of diseases. You can make a donation to Medical Research Charities itself and support the work of all our member charities. Please visit our website today, medicalresearchcharities.org. Become a part of Joining Forces to Find a Cure. This is Caregiver Reality with gerontologist David Levy and caregiver expert Paul Vadiato, who ask you to call in and speak with them on the air toll free at 888-565-1470. That's 888-565-1470 to share a story or important information. Now, back to today's Caregiver Reality Show. Well, we're back and I have to tell you that the commercial that Paul did at the break, he walked in here about 45 minutes ago, said to Freddie, I want to do a commercial. Mm -hmm. And we had no, I had no idea what it was until I just heard it. Paul, that was one heck of a commercial. I mean, it's not a commercial. It's an endorsement about who you really are, both as a caregiver, as president of Caregiver Reality. But most important, you carried a very important message, and you made that very clear, that Caregiver Reality is here to help. We're different than most other organizations out there in that we focus strictly on the caregiver. We make it non-clinical because that's 85% of caregiving, practical problem solving. And when I just listened to the new commercial from Medical Research Charities, <laughs> That's a heck of a commercial that they, they put that one together, and I got to tell you, I almost thought it was becoming the Medical Research Charities Hour, but I'm very, very pleased our relationship with them is growing. If I get a chance later, one of the shout-outs is to one of the underlying organizations called the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. But right now, if you recall, as the audience last week, uh, we had on Vicki Kind. She's a bioethicist, and one of the questions that I threw at her was, what, did, what was her opinion of emotional divorce? And the emotional divorce, real quick, is at a point where your loved one can no longer communicate, you know, and you just need something to fill up your life. It's not a sexual thing, it's much more of an emotional, kind of somebody to share things with when your loved one is no longer able to be a companion, a spouse, whatever. Her book, which I'm holding up now, The Compassionate Decision Making for Caregivers, I know I, I twisted it around, Caregiver Path, Compassionate Decision for Caregivers, has been a wonderful thing. But when she went out to her audience on Facebook and said, what do you think about emotional divorce? She got a firestorm back from people that agreed to people that said, how can you break your vows? And one of the things that I just want to say before she comes on, when I mentioned that, I was not talking about somebody whose spouse has an ingrown toenail and they, <laughs> and they think it's you know permission to have an affair. I'm talking about, for the most part, folks with dementia that have so progressed in it, that there's no real contact to be had emotionally, practically, or any other way. And I was looking at it from the perspective of somebody to go to the movies with, somebody to share a pizza with, and not somebody to disavow your vows. And so... Well, it's very emotionally charged for oh, sure. Oh, it's a heck of an issue. But yet, I must tell you, the firestorm that she had over it, when I raised this issue at support groups, even though many do not subscribe to it, there isn't anybody that doesn't agree that it's something that you may have to do at a certain point in your life just to keep your life together. So without any further ado, we were hoping to have Vicki on tonight by Skype, but technology being what it is, we don't have that opportunity. So good evening, Vicki. Good evening. I'm glad to be back with you guys. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. This is Paul. Welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And so are we. Uh, and uh, is, as you heard, I was just touching on the, the subject of emotional divorce, and you certainly heard an earful and an eyeful this week, didn't you? Yeah. It's all, it, the, it was really either, if you're a caregiver, you kind of understand why someone might. If you're not a caregiver, you can't believe someone would ever consider it. So it's really, you haven't walked in that person's shoes yet. So 
it was interesting. Yes, and, yeah, and I, I couldn't I, agree I, with I you more. It really yeah. is a caregiver issue and not one of general lifestyle whatsoever. Yeah. So, anyway, um, one of the things that we never got around to talking about that caregivers go through, and I'd like you to discuss it if you would, and it's that we go through anticipatory grieving, grieving as things slowly happen, like losing identity, yes. losing self, and another thing called ambiguous loss. And I know you're very familiar with these subjects, and I wonder if you might touch upon them for our audience, because you can do a far better job than I can. Okay. Um, well, the, because caregiving is such a long, long journey, that it becomes difficult because people usually grieve and you know, have to go through that grieving process just before someone dies or just after they've died and then throughout their life, of course, you grieve. But caregivers are grieving for a very long time, maybe 10 years before the death, 18 years before the death if it's Alzheimer's. And there are a lot of different grief and loss situations that come up and it's in what most caregivers tell me it's not just sadness, it's anger, it's shock because they can't believe it can get this bad again. It's um, feeling so withdrawn, like you don't even want to get out of bed. I actually created a word for this kind of long-term anticipatory grief. I call it care grieving. And care grieving is that grief and loss we feel when we care for and about another person. And it, and it keeps on going. It changes. Sometimes you're angry that what's happened to my life. Or maybe you are um, fearful. What am I going to do when he's gone? You know, there's, it's just an emotional roller coaster that's not just for a little while, it's for years. It's, ki it's kind of like having um, the house in the storm, so to speak. It's a long-term windstorm, and the house is coming apart a board and a brick at a time. Yeah, and I think that people, people can't support caregivers as much as we need them a lot of times because it's hard to sustain somebody who's suffering for years. You know, it, it, if, it's, if it's a short period, we bring, you know, casseroles over after somebody's died, or we, we, we help them get through that, those first early days after the death. But we're not expecting to hold somebody's hand for years and years. But that's what caregivers need. That's why I'm a big fan of support groups. Well, uh, and so are we. And a another point to exactly what you were saying is that what begins to happen is that f friends and well-meaning acquaintances and even family get tired of hearing the same story. Um, you know, just a different edition of it day by day by day. So and when you call up and they other. say, how are you doing? Oh, it was another tough day with Dad. And right. there's only so many you can do in a 10-year period of time and still have somebody respond to you on the other end of the phone. Yeah, and we don't even get another story. We become so overwhelmed by our caregiving role, and that's partially our choice. You know, people say it happens to us, but no, I think we choose it. And we could choose to still have some balance in our life, but we don't have another story. I realize when people say, how are you, since I didn't want to say how my dad was, mm -hmm. I didn't know what else to say. And even that was a loss. But I didn't even, I couldn't even say, well, guess what I did recently? Because who has time to do something for the energy? You know, first of all, I, I really like the, the phrase you coined, care grieving. I yeah. think that that is really spot on in terms of saying it like it is, and um, and I, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to start to use that. that. That would make me so happy, actually, because I have found when I've been working directly with caregivers, when you give it a name, when you say what you're experiencing is real, and it's, it's not in your imagination, you're not abnormal, this is real, your suffering is real. And then you can say, and you deserve help. You deserve to get some support. It, it just validates the whole process. Well, and, you, and you're absolutely right. You know, one of the circumstances that sometimes the American public doesn't realize, um, but 
we've got 50 or 60 million caregivers out there and let's just cut that number in half and say 25 million folks are seriously in the trenches every day between Alzheimer's, between dementias and other very serious afflictions. And could you imagine, you know, when you say we need help, if 10% of them, if two and a half million unpaid family caregivers got up tomorrow and said, I can't do this any longer, America, you got to send somebody in and you got to put them somewhere we would completely destroy our health care system. There would be no way for us to respond. And so when we forget about the caregiver or don't recognize the needs that they have over an extended period of time, forget the dollars, but where would we find the people in the beds even if we were to say that? And so they are the fabric of the whole health care system. They are the backbone and the front line of care, and especially care at home. And sometimes they become the patient also. So not only do you have the original patient who ne needs all this support, but now the caregiver falls apart. Yep. And now, now you have two people that are not feeling well. Yeah, you have two people who aren't doing well, who are, need to go to the hospital. I mean, it, it just compounds. So that's one of the reasons I actually created that word is to have us start talking about it so we can help people ask for help, which is so hard as a caregiver. Well, uh, Vicki, I was rereading the book probably for the third time this week, and I mean, every time I go through it, there's new learning that occurs, and I was hoping that you might spend some time in, in speaking about what you refer to as the least worst decision and the, uh, the, you know, the ethics that are involved in that because that's so perplexing. Yeah, I, this is something that I experienced firsthand. Um, I call it the least worst choice because there are moments in caregiving where we must make a choice and there is no good option. You know, I'm a person that will, I'll research, I'll ask, I'll do everything I can to find that perfect solution. And in caregiving, a lot of times there is no good solution, and, and now you have to choose from a bunch of bad ones. So for my dad, there came a point, because he was falling and hitting his head, and his dementia was getting worse, that I needed to move him to a care community. And at that time, there weren't a lot of great options in my town. And so there were three places I could choose from. Number one, number two, and number three were all terrible. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but how am I going to choose between three terrible options? And I realized I need to choose the least worst one, which doesn't ever make you feel good about the choice, but the reality is, is I couldn't take care of him, and he couldn't stay where he was living, and he needed extra support. So I picked the least worst facility and then six months later when a new place was built I moved him there right? Great. because sometimes there's short term decisions we've got to survive this moment in time and then we've got to also build a better long term plan right. Vicki uh, just as a follow up on that uh, when you're in that kind of a situation you, and you have siblings that are involved and you know, you're not looking at good choices Ethically, how do you react to the questions that they bring forward? Well, I, one of my philosophies is information. Give people the information and the education. A lot of facilities, you can actually take a video tour on the Internet. So if somebody's long distance and has all sorts of opinions, they can take a video tour. Or you can go in there and film a little bit so they can see it. Um, you can give them information about how to choose a nursing home or an assisted living. There's all sorts of lists of questions to ask out there. Because I think most people jump to bad decisions because they didn't think it through. They are making an emotional decision instead of a practical decision. Right. Wow. So Vicki, that, that is so spot on. I know I've used that expression twice. You know, one of our silent sponsors, Arden Court, has a wonderful online video um, which shows the Arden Court facility 
um, to the extent that it doesn't uh, in, impinge on anybody's privacy or HIPAA, but they really give you a pretty darn good tour of what it's like inside and out and interviews and things along those lines and I think that's a wonderful tool I just wanted to add one thing to what you said you know part of our mantra and part of what's in the caregiver manual that I put together when it comes to the least best choice mine is that if you have a plan and understand your options even if they're lousy options you make the best choice with what you have and have the peace of mind that at least you did the best you could with what you had and move on from there. Right. And I would add, make sure you reevaluate it. You know, look at it because sometimes you can take a bad option and make it better. You know, if you visit the care community, you know, and you bring cookies to the nurses <laughs> and if you, you know, do certain things to enhance and improve the facility yourself, you can really improve even a bad choice. Right. Here in Florida, we use donuts. Donuts, yeah, donuts are fine. I, what, I don't, people are like, I have to cook cookies. No, no, no. You're a caregiver, you don't have time. Right. And, yeah, you know, one of the I other things um, about that, besides the donuts, is as a good advocate, and you know this, when you show up at the facility and they know that you're kind of around and are taking real good interest in your loved one, they do too. If you care, they care. Um, otherwise, you can sometimes slip between the cracks, not that you may not get good medical care, but a lot of the emotional and other kinds of support that facilities provide really needs you to be a cheerleader for them to get behind it and do the same. Absolutely. The, the other thing that I do with families, especially that they're not all around at the same time, is you have to be putting out some kind of newsletter or put it on like eCare Diary or Caring Bridge, one of those different websites. You've got to communicate on a regular basis. So it's not a shock to the long distance caregiver that they're not, when did this happen? No, every month I've been giving you a report that mom is getting worse, mom is getting worse and giving information, then everyone's on the same page. They can't say, I didn't know. Right. You know, I was talking earlier today with the folks that created a, a, a very strong capability called Self-Health Network. And uh, they provide a lot of resources that are patient-focused and are moving into caregiver. And not only things like electronic medical record, but a lot of support tools that allow the doctor and password protected that you have the opportunity uh, to let the rest of the family and other interested parties see what's going on, but you can also limit how much they see. So yes, it's not a surprise, but you haven't overfilled their bucket, so to speak. And um, they're a growing company, and I think that they're going to make a real difference going forward in the kinds of things that you're talking about, not just in keeping the family informed, keeping the doctor informed, keeping the caregiver informed. And um, so I was, I was very happy. We had a very interesting conversation today regarding caregivers. And that was Self-Health Network, and they're out of California, and you can find them on selfhealthnetwork.com. Vicki, if, if I may, uh, and I know we're running a little short on time, uh, I know you do a lot of work with physicians and hospitals and whatnot. Uh, can you tell our listeners, as it applies to caregiving and ethics, what, what's going through their mind? You know, it, it's what doctors and nurses know about health and health care and end-of-life decisions is very different from what they share with you. Uh, they think that they, they change their, the, what they would say to each other about what they would want is very different from what they're trying to sell to the patient. Um, for instance, there was a study that was done and they asked doctors, what would you want if you're dying? Would you want chemotherapy and CPR and dialysis that and be on a ventilator? 80% or 90%, up to 90% of the doctors said, no way, I don't want that. But they're, then they turn around and they offer that to all the patients. And they never explain to the family or the patient, this is why I wouldn't want this. 
mean, you can choose it, but why 80 to 90 percent of doctors don't want this? You need to understand the why. And I just, I keep trying to talk to the doctors about this. I'm like, tell the truth. Tell what you know. And it, it doesn't mm -hmm. always work. <laughs> well, you know, and, and you also have to take a look at it. You know, we live in a very litigious day and age. And so if you haven't clearly spelled out a, as the patient in advanced directives um, exactly what you do and don't want, invariably, if, if they don't put chemotherapy on the table or radiation or whatever it may be, then somebody always comes out of the woodwork after the fact and says, you didn't do everything that you could to save X. And, um, and so they, they walk with, yes, they have a personal opinion about what they would do. But you can see the complication that sometimes arises if they turn around and say, well, you know, my doctor said he wouldn't do chemotherapy, and so we didn't do it. And then you get some relative that shows up that had nothing to do with it beforehand and says, you could have done chemotherapy and given him a, a, a longer life. And so I can see where the conflicts arise, both practically from the medical profession and also practically in what they need to tell a patient. And that's kind of what I like about hospice. Mm -hmm. They don't pull any punches. It's not right. that they'll say what they would or wouldn't do. When they step in, most of the things as an alternative stop happening. Right. One of the things I'm asking doctors to do is to tell it more visually, more experientially, what it is that the person is actually choosing. It's one thing for me to say, you should have chemotherapy. It's another thing to live through chemotherapy. Right? And we don't give people enough information about what it will actually feel like to go through this procedure or through this treatment. Because when people know what they're choosing and really see it and know what the experience will be like and what will either help them or will harm them, people will make wise decisions. But instead we just say, well, we'll just give you a little chemo. Right. It's not informed consent. You need to know the, the best part of what it can offer and the worst, and we have to keep our ears open even when they're talking about the worst, because we just want to pretend that would never apply to us. You know, Vicki, uh, many, many years ago, I was the caregiver for my mother, who moved to Florida, and three days after she got here, was diagnosed with what ultimately was inoperable lung cancer. And the doctor came down and said, well, we're going to start chemotherapy, or radiation, rather and they radiated her from, you know, neck all the way down. And it so burned her esophagus and everything else that she couldn't eat. And if I knew then what I know now, I never would have. But I never was given the choice of anybody doing exactly what you said, explaining what are the consequences of radiation or chemotherapy um, on your quality of life post-treatment. Right, and because they now know that chemotherapy, yes, a lot of times it works, and it, it and you get to live, but you are changed forever. You are your your health. You are now a chemo patient, a chemo recovery patient. You're always having the long term side effects. Oh I yes, Ra radiation is the gift that never stops giving. Yeah, I mean, when they said she's just going to get some radiation, they didn't say and she'll probably need a feeding tube because she'll never swallow again. Right. And she, you know, she'll have these, these terrible harms. You know, we're not, ethically, we're not supposed to try to scare a patient so much that they can't choose what we're offering. But I do think there's value in giving people at least some of the information. Whether, I don't think the doctors will actually tell us. I think you should go and talk to people who have gone through those procedures or through that kind of treatment. Cause what I might say to someone, oh yeah, I've been through it, this is what happened, you'll get a much more realistic view of what you're signing up for. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Having had radiation at age 40, I can only tell you that the complications in my life from having been radiated didn't appear till 20, 25 years later. 
and it's constantly renewing its efforts to complicate my life even though um, it's, it's almost 30 years since it's happened. And so I know firsthand both what I observed with my mother and what I have observed in myself, having been a radiation patient at an early age, exactly what you're talking about. And so I, I speak with the knowledge of being a caregiver, observing it, and being a patient and having it. Yeah, and I don't want, again, anyone to think, well, then I'll never choose that. You just have to understand that there are consequences. Of you know, course. I, if I needed radiation, I would seriously consider it. Because, but I would also find out that the two parts that I always remind caregivers to ask about or, or patients, what are the short-term consequences? Like, what is it like for those months to go through this? And then what are the long-term consequences? Right. You know, and... You know, luckily we're getting better at so many of these treatments that there are, there are fewer. I mean, 20 years ago, you probably had a different kind of radiation. Oh, 30 years now. ago, it was what they call dirty radiation. Today, it's so focal and so short that it would never create the problems that I have now if done today. Right. We, we just have to have longer conversations. And unfortunately, those aren't probably going to happen with our doctors because they just don't have the time. Their the system is so rushed. But you, I would call a cancer support group or an Alzheimer's support group or a group of people, people recovering from heart disease, like the American Heart Association, whatever right. the disease is, I would go on their website and read what I need to know as a patient. What is this like? Call and talk to somebody. Because we, we need to be in charge of our decisions. The doctor can only share so much. We agree, Paul. Vicki, we are so pleased to have you as a resource at Caregiver Reality. You bring a perspective and a knowledge base that is just amazing. And what you've given us in these last two visits are just immeasurable and so much comfort to our caregiver giver audience that's out there. Would you please give again your website and how people might be able to purchase your book so that they have it with them as a resource in their own homes? Absolutely. My website is www.kindethics.com and it's E-T-H-I-C-S. And there are a lot of great things you can down download there for caregivers, uh, crisis worksheets, etc. It's, it's really a proactive, helpful resource. Um, my book you can get um, online through like Amazon or independent booksellers or Barnes and Nobles. Um, it is in certain bookstores and it's also in libraries. So there are a lot of different ways you can get it. It's also available on Kindle and Nook and um, I guess iPad readers or whatever we call that. So it's, it's available pretty much any way you need it. Well, Vicki, I want to thank you again, as Paul just did. You've been a valuable resource. You're becoming somebody that we can turn to when we have these kinds of issues. So can the public. And so I want to thank you because we're getting close to the end and we've got a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. So thank you very much for being on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicki. Bye. And um, Vicki Kind is really a leader in the bioethics community, and we're very lucky to have her as a resource to tap into. Um, oh, and by the way, if you'd like a copy of my book, you can go to Kindle and just put in David Levy Caregiving, and it pops up. So uh, I'm allowed a selfie, Freddie. Come on. <laughs> and um, and you can also find it on our website, the newer, ver the the latest version. We just updated it for 2014, and it's on caregiverreality.com. So, Paul, what are you going to do for uh, Memorial Day? Well, I'm hoping for a quiet restful Memorial Day and you know if we could just get out a little bit and do some walking Debbie and I it would be a great weekend and of course there's always the honeydew list right can't can't forget the honeydew list uh, matter of fact when I leave here today uh, on my way home I have to stop and do my honeydews and that's what every caregiver has to do <clears throat> 
I've gotten so good at getting up and making the bed in the morning. If I had only known how good my bed making skills were when I was at camp and much younger, <laughs> I could have won all the prizes for dropping the quarter on the bed and seeing how uh -huh. high it would, you know, like they did in the military. Um, but I'm, I'm always amazed at just how good I am at the washing machine. You know, but they made it very easy with the drop-in packets, so uh, I, I guess I can't really pat myself on the back too much. Modern technology. David, just as we're wrapping up, uh, I had a conversation with a friend this week, and uh, he's been following the show along, and what he had said that really impresses him about the work that we're doing here uh, on Caregiver Reality Hour is that it's two men who are caregivers with a perspective that is generally not there and uh, really appreciate all of the leadership that you've given and I think our audience is getting just a tremendous education along the way. Well, this is what we're trying to do and we're also out there looking, just in case anybody happens to know, we're out there looking for a great national sponsor for caregiving because we have the opportunity to go to many more days of drive time and there's so much every week when we get done we turn around and say to ourselves well we could have kept that show going for another couple <laughs> of hours and not that all of you want to listen for many more hours but we do have that opportunity and so if you're a marketing director for a company that could definitely benefit from listening to a boomer audience our demographic is 44 to 65 and then we don't know where it goes after that uh, we'd love to talk to you and you can reach me at david at caregiverreality.com and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Freddie is giving us the indication that we're grinding down to one minute and uh, I just want to thank everybody, Arden Court, Scott, Solkoff, Vicki for being on tonight. Regents did a great job and of course medical research charities and don't forget www.crowdrise.com LGBT because we're looking to build a support group and a product of excellence for a community that needs it. So folks, South Florida, America and the world, want to thank you for listening. We'll be here next week. And Paul? Caregivers, take care of yourself. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday evening. And good night. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Reality Show. Each week, David Levy, a gerontologist, and Paul Vadiato, a caregiver expert with a combined over 25 years of experience providing practical and realistic help to caregivers struggling to keep up with the needs of a loved one who are unable to care for himself or herself. To reach David Levy, email him at david at caregiverreality.com or to reach Paul Vadiato, email paul at caregiverreality.com. And find out more online. Just go to caregiverreality.com. See you next week for another exciting show of Caregiver Reality.